So next we've got Rob Skiba. <laughs> Today, Rob, we're going to give you 20 minutes because we're on time. Isn't that amazing? Wow, a conference on time. That's, that is conference amazing. On time. <laughs> we had a fantastic seminar yesterday. It went so well. And we had a lot of media here too, which was good. So everybody was rushing around. It was great. Good to see you, Rob, and thank you for joining us today. Um, thank you for having me. So we're going to give you 20 minutes. And basically what I'm doing with the Skype is, is that I want you to tell us when you stumbled across flat earth and what it did to you because as a christian person that's been studying scriptures for so long how did you miss it this is what we're asking how did we miss this these studies in the bible so tell us what what how it affected you and how you felt when you found out that this whole heliocentric system that you thought was the marvel of god was actually a deception. Wow. Yeah, okay. Well, uh, it was April 13th, uh, 2015, that I listened to a Canary Cry radio interview that they did with Mark Sargent talking about Flat Earth Clues. And uh, at first I thought it was a joke, you know, like an April Fool's joke. And I'm like, oh, come on. But I listened to the whole thing. By the end of it, I'm going, shoot, that guy kind of made some sense. <laughs> so I went and got home and I watched all of his Flat Earth uh, Clues videos. I think he had 10 of them, I think, at the time. And uh, a couple days later on April 15th, 2015, I had him on my radio show. And if you listen to that interview, I'm still telling him, you know, look, I very much believe in the expanding Earth. It was a, a model by, uh, I think it was Neil Adams, I think is the guy's name, uh, had a model and he was using scripture or at least I was using scripture to justify it, um, expanding globe earth model. Uh, but I'm like, tell me more, tell me more. So, you know, he challenged me. He says, go ahead and I know you believe the earth's a globe. Prove it, Rob. Prove it without using NASA, the government, or the military. Well, of course, I did listen to him because the first thing I thought of was, well, we all have the pictures. Well, where did the pictures come from? NASA, the government, the military. So I've stumbled across the video on Jet Propulsion Laboratory's website of the Earth in 25 hours of rotation time lapse. And it's supposedly from the Galileo space probe in 1990. None of the clouds are moving. And I'm like, what? And then I start looking into other pictures and you know, you start seeing words like composite and CGI and things of that nature. So now I'm like, ah, come on. Well, I know the Bible supports the globe, right? Isaiah 4022. I've used that scripture myself many times. I also used to believe in the canopy theory. The canopy theory as put forward by people like Dr. Carl Baugh and Dr. Ken Hoven, who I respected their research and I parroted their research and used to teach it myself. Uh, so I started to pray. I'm like, okay, Father, you know, I do believe the Bible is true. I've spent my whole life trusting in it as my source for truth. But I have realized through my other research, prior research that I've done, that a lot of us come to the text with preconceived bias. And so being aware of that, I prayed. I said, Father, if I am bringing my own preconceived biases to the text, please remove them. Help me to come to the text with com a completely fresh slate and let your Holy Spirit reveal to me what it says. Well, if you do that, and I would challenge anybody out there who claims to be a Bible-believing Christian who believes there is a Paul to pray that prayer. In fact, I dare you to pray that prayer. <laughs> Father, remove my preconceived biases. Help me to just let the text say what it says. You know, well, you don't get it very far. I mean, you get to I think it's verse six, chapter one, first book of the Bible. <laughs> you hit this thing called the firmament. Pow! Yeah. Like, whoa! Now, what really got me is on day four. Scripture says he put the sun, moon, and stars in the firmament. In fact, I made a little model here. I got a 3D printer. I don't know if you guys can see this. I made a little model with, with the circle of the earth. Here's the circle of the earth. I printed this up on a little 3D printer I bought. So I got like this base right here, 
It's because it says that, uh, you know, Isaiah 40, 22 talks about the circle of the earth. Well, Isaiah is the last person to write about this stuff. You know, you have Job predating, pre predating Genesis, right? And Job talks about the, the circle is inscribed. So does Proverbs. So you got Job and Solomon long before Isaiah saying that this circle had been inscribed. And the Hebrew word used there is kalkhek, which means to cut in stone, like to chisel into something. And I, immediately the question comes up, well, how do you chisel or inscribe a ball into space? Like, that doesn't make any sense at all. You know, so, you know, the dry land appears. How does it appear? He carved a circle. And basically the way I look at it is it says he carved it onto the face of the deep. Well, Job also says the face of the deep is frozen. Ah, well, if the face of the deep is frozen, then what is the circle of the earth? I believe he just took his finger and carved a circle in it. Reep, reep. <laughs> he got the circle, you know, carved into the face of the deep. Well, uh, you know, because Ken Hovind and some of these other guys have a hard time looking at that, and they say, well, you know, if it's a circle, it's a disc. You know, and they have this idea that there's this disc floating in space or something. I'm like, no, there's this thing called the deep that has a face. By the way, spheres don't have a face. So when you start to look at how many times the Bible uses the phrase face of the earth, well, that doesn't work on a ball either. There's so many different uh, phrases in scripture just totally I like the negate. one that says that the foundation of the earth is like clay under a seal. Yeah, the, the earth is turned so as a seal. You've got on your hand there. Yeah, exactly. You know, like, like a signet ring or something, you know. So, going back to Genesis chapter 1, you got this thing, this this dome thing sitting on top of the earth. The circle was actually created within this. Because on day two, he creates the firmament. An entire day is dedicated to the creation of this thing. And Psalm chapter 19 says that it declares his handiwork. So this is an important thing. Isaiah says that, his, that, that God's throne is sitting on top of this thing. Like that, that's huge. So when it says that he put the sun, moon, and stars in the firmament, I'm stuck at verse six. I'm going, well, the canopy theory that I used to believe and teach requires the sun, moon, and stars to be outside of the firmament. Because if you have this, if the firmament was this canopy surrounding the earth, and we live in a heliocentric, globular earth, you know, Copernican model, then the sun and stars are outside the firmament. That doesn't work. So then I start looking, you know, and I see Ken Hovind tap dancing around that. He's trying to say, well, there must be another crystalline firmament somewhere else. I'm like, wait a minute. It says he created a firmament, he, the firmament. You know, you got, you know, singular words used there. It's one firmament. So. Yeah, I got stuck real quick at that point on scripture, and but I wanted the spinning ball to be true. Look, let's face it, I grew up with Star Wars and Star Trek, you know, and and you know I was born June 26, 1969. A month later, man was supposedly walking on the moon, right? And I was sitting in my mother's lap, and my dad is taking pictures of the television, which I still have. I still have those pictures, you know. So my whole life, I wanted to be an astronaut, you know. I, you know, I wanted to boldly go where no man has gone before, even though everywhere they went there were men speaking English. <laughs> so, you know, we have these preconceived biases, and we, we desperately want to force the Bible to fit those biases. You can't do that. We all do it. We all did it. I certainly did it. Uh, so how did that affect me? Well, I have to tell you, for the first year, the whole from April 15th to, to I would say, June, uh, the, or beginning of July 2016, I was struggling because I, very early on, I'm talking within the first week or two of talking to Mark Sargent, uh, I became absolutely 100% convinced the Bible was describing a circular, still flat earth set on pillars under a dome within which the sun and stars were placed on day four. I couldn't get around it. But... I wanted the spinning ball in space to be true. So I had these two very weighty things, right? I had the, the Word of God that I claimed to believe in, and I built my whole life on saying that this is my source for truth in one hand. And over here, I have the Copernican spinning ball thing that I love and want to be true, and they are not compatible. Yes, exactly. And I was, it's practically every component of every, In every way, it's opposite. Yeah. Yeah, in every way, it's opposite. Well, I mean, I think some of these creation ministries have done a fantastic job of, of fighting evolution. 
but they stop short. Evolution is not even remotely plausible without the Copernican principle. It's a whole spinning ball in evolutionary terms that set the stage for biological evolution. So, you know, we, we, they have done a great job of exposing the lies of geology, exposing the lies in archaeology even, and certainly in biology. So why are they giving cosmology a pass? Uh, you can't, you, it's not compatible. So I start praying, Father, what do I do with this? I, I'm convinced, absolutely convinced that your Bible says this. Yet I believe this. And I prayed every night. And I'm not kidding, I prayed this every night. And it wasn't like boo-hoo-hoo kind of tears, but it was praying fervently to the point where tears are in my eyes. And the only answer that I would get consistently for a year was I said what I said. God wasn't apologizing for it. <laughs> he was explaining it. He was like, dude, I said what I said. Well, then many of your, your audience there may have seen the video I did with Rick Hummer uh, in the summer of 2016 when we went across Lake Michigan to prove that the Chicago skyline was not a mirage. Many, many things happened to us on that trip. And um, when I came back from that trip, my prayers remained the same, but the answer I was getting back was different. It wasn't so much I said what I said. It was, are you going to believe me now, Rob, or what? <laughs> And it was like, it was the or what that had me really scared. <laughs> and, you know, finally, when I, when I was forced to reckon with the lies of science, and I would say scientism, science falsely so-called, it's all across the board. They're lying to us about everything. So I'm going, you know, this has, you know, the Bible has given me no reason to doubt at all. This over here has given, this has given me every reason to doubt. So... You know, I finally just said, okay, I trust your word. I believe your word is true. I'm going to throw the other stuff out. And I'm going to commit. And then I went on uh, Flat Earth and Other Hot Potatoes and announced to the world, guess what? <laughs> I'm a flat earther. This takes us on to the second question, which is, what? so, so that drove you to do some value projects and you started changing. Because you were already teaching biblical uh, messages and scriptures. So you started putting the flat earth into your projects and so you've got testing the globe. Can, can you tell us what you're actually doing or what you have been doing for the last two or three years um, through your YouTube channel and you also have other biblical teaching sessions, a house church online, um, and any projects that you're doing, if you could tell us what those are. Yeah, absolutely. I've been really busy, especially the last uh, few months, of course, last several years, 10 years really is when I got on the public scene doing research. I started with sort of government conspiracies and things dealing with the giants and the Nephilim and the hybrids of ancient mythology and whatnot. That's sort of how I entered the public scene. That was what I was doing before, and that all led to the creation of a TV series that I started to develop in 2009 called Seed, which was meant to take all of this research and then put it in a, in a fact-based fiction framework that I could present to the world in a cool and entertaining and fun way. See, here's the thing. You could do seminars like this, conferences, you could do YouTube videos, you could write books, and people go, eh, whatever. You put it in science fiction, everybody believes it. <laughs> you know? it's, like, it's like people get married in Klingon and join the Jedi Church. You know? <laughs> so, you know, people wonder, they got into my research, my YouTube channel stuff, you know, many people came in, in fact, I was doing some of my own research, looking into it as a... Uh, redoing my business plan, and back in 2014, I had 10,000 subscribers on YouTube. Well, now I got close to 200,000. The vast majority of those came as a result of the flat Earth stuff. So, you know, people came in as a result of that research that I was doing for the better part of 2015 through 17, and into 18 a little bit. Uh, and then all of a sudden, I switched gears to start working on the stuff that I worked on before. People, are like, what are you doing? What are you doing? I'm like, look, guys. <laughs> I'm taking that same research, all that four years of flat earth research is going into that also. In fact, I had to rewrite tons of it because it started out in a heliocentric spinning ball kind of paradigm. So uh, that's what I've been working on. Uh, also working on, you know, I don't know if everybody's aware of it, but I published the book Test in the Globe, uh, Volume 1, that has a synthetic astronomy, 100 proofs, and um, uh, what's the other one? Uh, 
uh, uh, uh, ten hundred. I think it's just those two. Yeah, well, one hundred proofs and uh, synthetic astronomy with commentary. Well, this is the manuscript for <laughs> volume two. Uh, and so uh, Sh Sheila and I are working on getting this done, hopefully before the big conference in Dallas coming up, volume two. So you know, lots of stuff going on. People can check all that stuff out. Yeah, and it's important to have uh, um, someone that's right in on it with you. So so your family is all, they're all flat earthers, are they? Or do you have anybody in your family that thinks you're a nutter, Rob? Uh, yeah, I, I would say many of my family thinks I'm crazy, but they love me anyway. Yeah, that's great, that's good. <laughs> okay, we've got about five minutes, so maybe the last five minutes um, you could talk about the future of Flat Earth. Um, mm. We talked to Flat Earth Man just recently, and he was, um, in a nutshell, he wanted people to start implementing whatever their talents and skills, resources and creativity are, is to actually develop uh, some flat earth platform for their lives to be educational and just keep moving forward. The other thing was there's some censorship coming down upon us, uh, especially recently here in New Zealand, which is the first time a, quite a tragic event happened, and um, suddenly we've, we've, we've had the hammer fall. And I think that maybe we're thinking that maybe in the near future that Flat Earth is going to be something that, uh, because it's a threat to their systems, that they're actually going to sort of suddenly overnight shut it down sort of thing. So give us some advice as to, because I believe that people need to start to calm down a bit and strategize and be a bit more wise, because there's a lot of censorship, Facebook banning, YouTube deleting out of things, lots of it happening uh, for no real reason. Nothing, no community standards are really being broken. So do you have any advice of, of how we can move forward as like, um, like a New Zealand membership group and, and, and what we should do or, um, do you know what I mean? Yeah, I do. I, I know exactly what you mean. Um, you know, on April 13th, I posted uh, a, a um, thing on my Facebook page that Robbie Davidson had also posted, you know, NASA reveals the first photo of a black hole. <laughs> oh. <laughs> 55 freaking million light years away. Keep oh. in mind that, that one light year is six trillion miles. Okay. And there are idiots out there who actually believe we have a photograph of something yes. 55 million times six trillion miles away. Yeah. This is because of the ongoing slavery to the grave indoctrination I was involved. Because even the church had been indoctrinated against the own word they're studying. Yeah. So, you know, we are posing a threat to this establishment that has made a career out of lying to us. And NASA is stealing 50-something million dollars a day uh, from us to do it. So, you know, that, that's a tremendous threat to that establishment. So I do fully anticipate that most of the mainstream things that we're trying to do through social media is going to get shut down, cracked down. I'm already seeing things, you know, see my own YouTube channel being censored and things of that nature. Also so, has, has yeah, everybody has. And so, you know, A, we're going to have to probably find alternative platforms to uh, post on. But B, you know, for me, one of the reasons I'm doing Seed is to get this stuff out in a way that people can receive it, but it goes under the radar. You know, you, you, again, you put it in science fiction, I mean, that whole TV series Under the Dome, right? Nobody cared. Who cares? Under the Dome, cool. Well, you know, what if I take that a little step further? <laughs> you know, so I'm with Flat Earth Man on that. You know, you know, music, the arts, you know, I really think we, we would have a much more um, powerful impact if we are able to do it through the arts because that's how they have done it. I just watched an episode of uh, Star Trek Next Generation last night. It was episode 20, season 6. It's called The Chase. And in that episode, the, you had the, the Earthlings from the Federation, the Klingons, uh, the Cardassians, and the Romulans all finding clues in their own DNA that led them on a chase throughout the universe to try to solve a puzzle. And, and when they did, the prize was finding the first ancient race, 4 billion year old race, a hologram, telling them Congratulations, you found your parents. We're the ones that seeded the universe. You know, that's 
that's why you all have five fingers and you know five you know on each hand and five toes on each foot and your bipedal and yeah your heads are lumpy and whatnot but you basically look the same yeah. well because because we are your creators so you know they have been very successful at seeding our minds with lies for decades using mainstream fictional uh, platforms and I think really we can do the same thing and that's you know what I'm trying to do at seed that's fantastic, Rob. I think we've had our time now. We're going to go on to our next Skype. <laughs> Wonderful to see you. Great work that you're doing. We love you. We send our blessings from New Zealand. Everybody's going to get your links and everything. We're going to send out a newsletter as well. I'll catch up with you next week. Um, All right. Have a chat with you. It's been wonderful seeing you, and thank you once again. Yes, right. thank you guys so much. I appreciate the people right here. Okay.